<laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about label repairs. I want to say, emphasise that it's, it's not just you're not just tying the label back into the side of the glenoid. You've got to treat the capsule as well, which is really where 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 the, the main problem is with these patients. Um, so I, I'm going to go through this quite quickly because we all want to get back into the lab as quickly as possible. Because, you know, this is a your opportunity to use the lab. You can. <coughs> and listen to lectures about surgery, but you won't get this opportunity that often uh, to, to use these, these, these equipment. Uh, principles of stabilisation with surgery, I mean, like most orthopaedic sports surgery, it is to restore function. And uh, certainly for shoulder instability, you're trying to prevent further subluxations and dislocations. Actually, patients tend to have very good function uh, in between the episodes of dislocations. Uh, and um, in a lot of patients, they sort of can, can neglect it. And, and certainly in the last 10 years, we're, we're appreciating much more the patients with chronic, uh, <coughs> chronic instability problems where there's been a lot of bone loss. Uh, and this is where we start talking about doing non anatomical stabilizations to try and address that bone loss. But in terms of today, we're just going to talk about soft tissue repair, repairing the labour of the capsule, um, and I'm uh, going to go, go through the technique in, the, in its broadest sense, really. Um, so, a labral repair works well. You're, you're reattaching the labrum and the capsule to, to the rim of the glenoid and, and the neck. The key thing, though, I think, is, is the superior capsule shift. You're basically retensioning. The, the capsule and, and probably these work because they improve the proper receptive feedback. And that's as important as reattaching the, 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 the capsules. Does do, do label repairs work though? What does, what does everybody Is it a good operation? Yeah. Well, if I told you it was an operation that in some series has a 30% failure rate, is that a good operation? I think I think we're, we're so for a long time. We, we, about 20 years ago, we started being able to do uh, arthroscopic label repairs very easily, and so thought, everyone thought it was a great operation to do. And what they were doing was they were following up their patients for one or two years, and they were seeing maybe five percent failure rates. Actually, if you you um, follow these patients up for, for longer, you're going to see much higher failure rates, uh, and, and that's probably a combination of. Uh, their activity level, uh, because people who have unstable shoulders are usually doing quite a lot of sports like rugby, uh, but also the, the, the bone loss, which, which I'm not going to go into today because it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a whole it's a very good topic. Um, but what probably happens over a period of two to five years post surgery is everything stretches out again. The capsule itself is, is, is always traumatised. Uh, even if you know the, 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 the pull off is is where the glenoid on the capsule comes onto the glenoid, that's where you see the damage. But probably the capsule is, is stretched, and all the, the sort of the proprioceptive mechanisms are, are, are permanently damaged. You can restore those to a degree, but you, you won't be able to restore the native stability of the shoulder with this, this operation alone. So it, it's still got very much got a place in. Uh, in our, our sort of treatment um, armory, uh, but you've got to be quite careful about who you, you select for uh, label repairs. <coughs> so a little bit, uh, Olivia went over the capsule density very well, so I won't, I won't um, uh, go in through it again. Um, the, the, the injuries are seen in this part of the labrum the anterior-inferior labrum, and this is really where the inferior, or the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament inserts, and, and we think that's really where the pathology is. What, what do the superior glenohumeral humeral ligament and the middle glenohumeral ligament do? It's restricts external rotation. Now some of the books <coughs> say that they stabilize the shoulder and the arm is inducted into the side. And slightly ele elevated, but actually you can you can excise the middle glenohumeral ligament 
and it doesn't increase the, 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 the instability of the shoulder. You can also excise <coughs> superior glenohumeral ligament, which is within the rotator interval, which we did a lot of splitting phase shots. Again, it doesn't seem to increase the amount of instability of patients. Again, and, and probably those are essentially redundant uh, structures uh, <coughs> because you have sort of got subscapularis sitting across the front of the shoulder when your arm is abducted. When you bring your shoulder up here, actually the sub subscapularis rises up and you dislocate because you are slipping underneath the subscapularis. So, so this is the structure, or this is the area that we have to repair, and, and it's, the it's the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament that we're trying to retention and, and restore into its original position. So, uh, we've already talked about a bit about doing uh, examination on anaesthetic prior to you starting the operation, it's, it's very important to do that in, in instability and, and also compare side, side to side because what might be slightly unstable for someone may be, may be actually normal for someone else. Uh, go, go through a standard posterior being portal, do a diagnostic scope and again as I was sort of alluding to, have a look at how, <coughs> how much glenoid has been eroded from the front of the, the glenoid. Uh, and how big are the hill sac lesions at the back. Now, I tend to CT all my patients prior to, to stabilization surgery to, to quantify that because it's probably a more accurate way of doing it. Um, and obviously look for other things <coughs> like cuff tears and biceps injuries which do, do often occur at the same time. Um, so the first thing you do once you've got your scope in and you're about to start as you establish an anterior superior port, it's somewhere between the coracoid and the anterior border of the, the acromion. But in, in, you want to use the needle to go yourself in, go send to try and get it through the middle of the rotator interval. Try and avoid the bicep sling. If you damage that, they can develop bicep symptoms afterwards. And you want you want to make sure you have a trajectory that goes down onto the glenoid between about three. Five o'clock. Don't come in too flush to the glenoid. Don't come in too flush to the, the, the articular surface. You want to sort of come in at about 45 degrees. Um, and if you ask 10 shoulder surgeons how they do a stabilization, you've got 10 different answers. Uh, and so you can use one cannula, you can use two cannulas, depending on, on, on your technique. But usually they both come in through the rotator for the same place. So the next stage, once you've got your cannula, your portal in, is to, to actually complete the injury. When the, the labrum gets pulled off, the anterior glenoid, it, it doesn't get pulled off in entirety. Um, there are still strands connected to the glenoid neck, so you actually want to completely release all that so you can then <coughs> fully mobilise the capsular labrum complex and position it. You want to come in just between the articular surface and the glenoid and along the the neck, so you take the, the labrum and the, the capsule off as, as a single entity. <laughs> For this we use this device called the Liberator, which is essentially a little blade on the end of a, on, on the end of a prong. <coughs> you then freshen up the glenoid neck with a rasp, and create a nice bleeding surface, good healing, healing bone. You then got to pass a suture through the labrum and the capsule. Um, there are basically three different types of instruments for doing that. You have a suture passer, you might, somebody might have come across it, there's a, something called an uh, AccuPass or the Spectrum from, from Comed. Essentially it's a little curved needle which is cannulated and you want to, this, this diagram doesn't really uh, uh, demonstrate it well, but you, you need to get behind the labrum but also you want to go around so you pick up quite a lot of the capsule as well. Um, there are the other types of graspers where you just basically slide <coughs> these jaws between the, the labrum <coughs> and the capsule and, and grab the, the, the tissue and then pass the, the suture through or use these, these penetrators <coughs> and bird beaks which you can push the suture through, through the tissue. <coughs> now in order to get, so as I was saying earlier on, in order to get your, your tension back in the capsule, you have to 
perform something called a superior capsular shift, which is basically hoisting up the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And that's, there are various ways of doing it. I do it by using something called TOTS, the temporary outside tension suture. So the initial suture uh, you pass through is as low as you can get with your instrumentation. Pass that through. You then <coughs> take it out of the cannula, pass it around the side of the cannula, and, and pull on it. And that will pull everything up. You then do the same process with your suture passer, but lower down, and that will then essentially pull up the whole of the uh, the, the, the capsule and the, the, the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and then that will become essentially your suture you're going to put in your your, your, your bottom uh, anchor. So once you've done that, you've got to reattach the, the labrum using these anchors, and we tend to do anchors at 5, 4 and 3 o'clock in that order. Um, uh, the, if you're going above 3 o'clock, which is usually determined by the upper level of subscapularis, you're probably not repairing much by way of capsule and those anchors up there become slightly redundant. <coughs> and it's, uh, so we, there, are, there are loads of anchors uh, next door and um, we, can, we, can, we can try various ones, but uh, the, 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 basically, there are two types of anchors. There's knotted, um, which are technically more demanded to use for, for sure, but you tend to control, be able to control the, the uh, tension in the shoots a bit more. <coughs> Knotless um, are, are certainly easier to use, um, but they're sort of fixed tension. You can't really change the tension once you've engaged the, the anchor within the, the bone. Um, so in summary, um, as I said, the aim of this of a labral repair is actually to, to reattach the labrum and the capsule, the, the, the IGHL part of the capsule. Uh, in order to do this, you need to fully mobilise the capsule and the labrum together, <coughs> and fix down the labrum and the capsule together as a, as a whole. Uh, as I said, retentioning IGHL is, is the key component of this operation. Any questions? Using, um, are you refreshing the bone surface in the glenoid with any saver, or you just? I tend to use a rasp. Just, <laughs> just with a rasp, you're not using yeah. any saver. Kind of. yeah. But you can use a shaver. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, on your fellowship, you didn't see this, right? Everyone gets an arthroscopy latter day. No. So, <laughs> what, what, no, do you I think this is a better operation than an arthroscopy latter day for, without bone? Um, I think you've got to look at the. Uh, the activity of the patient as well. So, yeah, if they're a high-level rugby player, they will almost certainly get a uh, some sort of bone block procedure because I think this is just not enough to cope with the force that put through the shoulder. You say you <coughs> you image with CT. Is that CT arthrogram? No, just plain CT. Yeah. <coughs> so that's like MR and CT. MRA and CT? No, just actually just CT. Because really? I, I think the the MR, as long as you're happy with the diagnosis, you know, they are, you know, <coughs> they are dislocating, you know which direction they're dislocating. The MRI doesn't, I don't think, contributes much more information than you already know. Um, would it pick up a haggle, for example? Because that would change what you do, wouldn't it? Um, it you have no, um, fair enough. Uh, it, no, CT would not pick up a haggle, um, but you know, you, hopefully you would pick that up at a surgery and you could address the haggle there. Do you use a coblator? There's a lot of my colleagues, <coughs> the coblation device, you know, they're sort of off, the, the radio frequency pointy things. No, I just, I just use a, a liberator, a liberator, liberator yeah. yeah. Again, try and use, avoid using diathermy heat. or heat. The sort of bleeding surfaces where you want to <coughs> take place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lydia mentioned earlier between 12 and 3 o'clock you can have that normal bearing. Yeah. I've not seen that, but how obvious is it to differentiate between what a normal bearing was or what the new tear may be? <coughs> well, you sort, of know, you sort of know when you've got above 3 o'clock because when you get your, you want to grasp the tissue with your suture pass or whatever you're using, you find actually above 3 o'clock all there is is labrum. There's no capsule behind it. 
to the capsule. The capsule is almost efficient from three up to about one when you start the so, 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 um Toby mentioned grabbing <coughs> the capsule and doing your capsular shift as part of grabbing the labrum with your hook device, whatever that is. Or, but, so that's inferior, but you only do that inferiorly. If you start grabbing the capsule at three o'clock or closing anything above three o'clock, you can be mindful that you don't want to shorten the middle of the inhumeral ligament and they'll wind up having a, like a, a really stiff frozen shoulder afterwards. But say someone who had a normal 360 degree labrum, you, surely you can tear, can you not tear between 12 and 3? You can, but what they're saying is a so, a, 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 only a tear at 3 to 12 o'clock probably is not clinically relevant. But if you've got one that goes all the way around, yeah, so you still need to repair. Between 12 and 6, <coughs> theoretically you only need to repair yeah, exactly. 6 to 3 o'clock. <coughs> you can forget yeah. about what's above 3 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably the way to think about it. I mean, if there's a tear that high, it may indicate there's a problem with the biceps yeah. anchor. So it might or more a slap lesion, which way. If you've got a type 2 balanced biceps attachment, so the labrum is similar at the front and the back, but the labrum is um, unstable at the top because you push down on the biceps and it falls into the joint, then yeah, you would repair up them. What's the role of what's called MR arthrogram in diagnosing labor tears? Um, or a slap lesion? Or why, why do we get that? <coughs> well, that? That for me is if the, the, the <coughs> diagnosis is not clear, if they've got, you've got uh, subjective instability of the patient saying that their, their shoulder's unstable, mm -hmm. but actually there's, there's not some particularly hard findings on examination. Actually, if you talk to MSK radiologists these days, they say that MRI has got so good that actually they prefer diagnosing instability from plain yeah. MRIs rather than MR arthrograms because actually the contrast um, has such an effect on, on the tissue that it sort of obliter <coughs> obliterates out some of the more subtle findings. Mm. Okay, well, my, my, my question is, um, your 30% failure in three years, <coughs> do you review that? In your experience? Yeah, um, And how yes. difficult is it to review? You, you use a one block, yeah? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it depends what they had first time around, but yeah, if, if I was advising a, 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 a failed label repair in, 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 a, in a young age <coughs> patient, they would almost certainly get a bone block procedure of some type. Okay. Probably another sort of glass in my book. Yeah, all I see, no. Yeah, it's going with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>